I'm going to read one of Hawthorne's earlier stories, Wakefield. In some old magazine or newspaper, I recollect a story told as truth of a man, let us call him Wakefield, who absented himself for a long time from his wife. The fact, thus abstractly stated, is not very uncommon, nor, without a proper distinction of circumstances, to be condemned either as naughty or nonsensical. Howbeit, this, though far from the most aggravated, is perhaps the strangest instance on record of marital delinquency, and moreover, as remarkable a freak as may be found in the whole list of human oddities. The wedded couple lived in London. The man, under pretense of going a journey, took lodgings in the next street to his own house, and there, unheard of by his wife or friends, and without the shadow of a reason for such self-banishment, dwelt upwards of twenty years. During that period, he beheld his home every day, and frequently the forlorn Mrs. Wakefield. And after so great a gap in his matrimonial felicity, when his death was reckoned certain, his estate settled, his name dismissed from memory, and his wife, long, long ago, resigned to her autumnal widowhood, he entered the door one evening quietly, as from a day's absence, and became a loving spouse till death. This outline is all that I remember. But the incident, though of the purest originality, unexampled and probably never to be repeated, is one, I think, which appeals to the generous sympathies of mankind. We know, each for himself, that none of us would perpetrate such a folly, yet feel as if some other might. To my own contemplations, at least, it has often recurred, always exciting wonder, but with a sense that the story must be true, and a conception of its hero's character. Whenever any subject so forcibly affects the mind, time is well spent in thinking of it. If the reader choose, let him do his own meditation, or if he prefer to ramble with me through the twenty years of Wakefield's vagary, I bid him welcome, trusting that there will be a pervading spirit and a moral. Even should we fail to find them, done up neatly and condensed into the final sentence. Thought has always its efficacy, and every striking incident its moral. What sort of man was Wakefield? We are free to shape, our, shape out our own idea and call it by his name. He was now in the meridian of life. His matrimonial affections, never violent, were sobered into a calm, habitual sentiment. Of all husbands, he was likely to be the most constant, because a certain sluggishness would keep his heart at rest, wherever it might be placed. He was, an, he was intellectual, but not actively so. His mind occupied itself in long and lazy musings that ended to no purpose, or had not vigor to attain it. His thoughts were seldom so energetic as to seize hold of words. Imagination, in the proper meaning of the term, made no part of Wakefield's gifts. With a cold but not depraved nor wandering heart, and a mind never feverish with riotous thoughts, nor perplexed with originality, who could have anticipated that our friend would entitle himself to a foremost place among the doers of eccentric deeds? <clears throat> Had his acquaintances been asked, who is the man in London, the surest to perform nothing today, which should be remembered on the morrow, they would have thought of Wakefield. Only the wife of his bosom might have hesitated. She, without having analyzed his character, was perfectly aware of a quiet selfishness that had rusted into his inactive mind, of a peculiar sort of vanity, the most uneasy attribute about him, of a disposition to craft, which had seldom produced more positive, positive effects than the keeping of petty secrets, hardly worth revealing. And, lastly, of what she called a little strangeness, sometimes, in the good man. This latter quality is indefinable and perhaps non-existent. <clears throat> Let us now imagine Wakefield bidding adieu to his wife. It is the dusk of an October evening. His equipment is a drab greatcoat, a hat covered with an oilcloth, top boots, an umbrella in one hand, and a small portmanteau in the other. 
He has informed Mrs. Wakefield that he is to take the night coach into the country. She would fain inquire the length of his journey, its object, and the probable time of his return. But, indulgent to his harmless love of mystery, interrogates him only by a look. He tells her not to expect, expect him positively by the return coach, nor to be alarmed should he tarry three or four days, but at all events to look for him at supper on Friday evening. Wakefield himself, be it considered, has no suspicion of what is before him. He holds out his hand, she gives her own, and meets his parting kiss in the matter-of-course way of a ten years' matrimony. And forth goes the middle-aged Mr. Wakefield, almost resolved to perplex his good lady by a whole week's absence. After the door has closed behind him, she perceives it thrust partly open, and a vision of her husband's face through the aperture, smiling on her and gone in a moment. For the time, this little incident is dismissed without a thought. But long afterwards, when she has been more years a widow than a wife, that smile recurs and flickers across all her reminiscences of Wakefield's visage. In her many musings, she surrounds the original smile with a multitude of fantasies, which make it strange and awful. <clears throat> As, for instance, if she imagines him in a coffin, that parting look is frozen on his pale features. Or, if she dreams of him in heaven, still his blessed spirit wears a quiet and crafty smile. Yet, for its sake, when all others have given him up for dead, she sometimes doubts whether she is a widow. But our business is with the husband. We must hurry after him along the street, ere he lose his individuality and melt into the great mass of London life. It would be vain searching for him there. Let us follow close at his heels, therefore, until after several superfluous turns and doublings, we find him comfortably established by the fireside of a small apartment previously bespoken. He is in the next street to his own and at his journey's end. He can scarcely trust his good fortune, and having got thither unperceived, recollecting that at one time he was delayed by the throng in the very focus of a lighted lantern, and again there were footsteps that seemed to tread behind his own, distinct from the multitudinous tramp around him, and anon he heard a voice shouting afar and fancied that it called his name. Doubtless a dozen busybodies had been watching him and told his wife the whole affair. Poor Wakefield, little knowest thou thine own insignificance in this great world. No mortal eye but mine has traced thee. Go quietly to thy bed, foolish man, and on the morrow, if thou wilt be wise, get thee home to good Mrs. Wakefield and tell her the truth. Remove not thyself, even for a little week, from thy place in her chaste bosom. Were she, for a single moment, to deem thee dead or lost or lastingly divided from her, thou wouldst be woefully conscious of a change in thy true wife forever after. It is perilous to make a chasm in human affections, not that they gape so long and wide, but so quickly close again. <clears throat> Almost repenting of his frolic, or whatever it may be termed, Wakefield lies down betimes, and starting from his first nap, spread, spreads forth his arms into the wide and solitary waste of the unaccustomed bed. No, thinks he, gathering the bedclothes about him, I will not sleep alone another night. In the morning he rises earlier than usual and sets himself to, dis to consider what he really means to do. Such are his loose and rambling modes of thought that he has taken this very singular step with the consciousness of a purpose indeed, but without being able to define it sufficiently for his own contemplation. The vagueness of the project and the convulsive effort with which he plunges into the execution of it are equally characteristic of a feeble-minded man. Wakefield sifts his ideas, however, as minutely as he may, and finds himself curious to know the progress of matters at home, how his exemplary wife will endure her widowhood for, of a week, and, briefly, how the little sphere of creatures and circumstances in which he was the central object will be affected by his removal. A morbid vanity, therefore, lies nearest the bottom of the affair. But how is he to attain his ends? 
not certainly by keeping close in this comfortable lodging, where, though he slept and awoke in the next street to his home, he is effectually abroad as if the stagecoach had, stagecoach had been whirling him away all night. Yet, should he reappear, the whole project is knocked in the head. His poor brains being hopelessly puzzled with this dilemma, he at length ventures out, partly resolving to cross the head of the street and send one hasty glance towards his forsaken domicile. Habit, for he is a man of habits, takes him by the hand and guides him, wholly unaware, to his own door, where, just at the critical moment, he is aroused by the scraping of his foot upon the step. Wakefield, whither are you going? 